Let's turn our attention to what Turing names the Lady Lovelace objection in the paper. This objection is named after Ada Lovelace. She was the daughter of the English poet and romantic era figure Lord Byron. In fact, shortly after she was born, Byron abandoned her and her mother never to return to England. And so her mother saw to it that she was educated primarily in kind of anti-romantic era topics like mathematics and logic. And she was actually quite a good mathematician. She was primarily known as a mathematician and a writer and was associated very strongly with Charles Babbage and his development of his general purpose mechanical computer, the analytic engine, which he proposed and was trying to build but never managed to actually complete. She was probably the first to recognize the engine's potential for applications beyond numerical calculation and was the first to publish an algorithm intended to be carried out on such a machine. And so in some ways, she is one of the first computer programmers. She unfortunately died rather young at the age of 36 in 1852 of uterine cancer. So Turing quotes her to the effect that computers can only follow their programs and hence they're capable of nothing original. Now there are a number of different ways we might understand that kind of statement. One might understand this claim in terms of adaptive or independent action. So computers can't adapt, they can't improvise, they aren't independent, they do what they're told to do. Another way that we might understand it is as a claim that machines cannot think since an essential element of thinking is creativity and originality. So they lack spontaneity and hence can't be intelligent. Turing's response is really rather uninspired or inapt. Turing construes Lovelace's remarks as asserting that computers can never do anything that we haven't anticipated. And so his response keys on that idea. If you mean doing something unanticipated, he says, well, that happens all the time. You can't really predict what a machine will do simply because you programmed it. As a result, he suggests any reasonably complex program, like any reasonably complex human being, will be difficult to predict or anticipate even if one knows the basic patterns of its behavior. Turing also anticipates and tries to respond to an idea that computer programs are merely executing a set of rules on their data and hence won't produce anything novel or heretofore unseen. But he suggests that in fact, you can use rules operating on data to create all sorts of novel things. And so he doesn't think that this notion of originality is outside of the ability of computers either. In the discussion of learning, he suggests that these sorts of features of computers could be enhanced by introducing a random element into the computational device. He finishes this section by suggesting that any computer that could pass his Turing test would also be able to pass Lady Lovelace's originality test. As is the case in his response to the disabilities argument, Turing puts a lot of emphasis on the potential of computers to perform in ways that they don't currently perform. And so some 60 or 70 years on, it behooves us to think about whether or not Turing's faith was in fact well placed. If we think of the standard of originality as independent, adaptive, goal-oriented action, then we should note on Turing's behalf that computers drive cars, they fly planes, they run trains, they manage stock portfolios, pick movies, translate languages, they beat humans at Jeopardy, at chess, at Go. Computers recognize and respond to language commands, to faces, to objects. In most cases, computers now learn how to perform these tasks and they continue to improve in their performance as a result of experience. In short, computers have developed an impressive record of independent, adaptive, goal-oriented actions. We might also note that the very notion of originality is in, to some degree antithetical to the purpose of psychology and artificial intelligence and cognitive science generally. So Turing might well have noticed that no theory of mind for the last hundred years has supposed that minds can do more than operate on their inputs and internal representations according to rules. For example, British empiricism or rationalism. Furthermore, were he arguing today, he could point to programs that write sonnets, stories, paint pictures, and so on. Indeed, starting around 2010, there was a big 
pushing artificial intelligence to create programs that could do these sorts of much more creative or insightful acts. Now, there's been an uneven development, but the development has been sort of impressive to my mind. Here's an example of paintings by Google's Deep Dream. Now, these are early paintings by Deep Dream, and one of the things that they illustrate very strongly is it was very impressed with eyes and it loved dogs because they appear all over the place. In fact, animals in general. So these are both reproductions of famous paintings by Deep Dream where, you know, you think to yourself, wow, you shouldn't have done that extra tab of acid there, Deep Dream. However, those works transformed into what people refer to now as style transfer programs. And style transfer programs try to master the styles of particular painters and then use those styles to create novel paintings in that style. Now, this began really around 2015. The pictures on the right there are from a research paper by a German group that was published in 2015 where they took original paintings and they tried to get a computer program that would then reproduce those paintings and mimic styles. As you can see by the pictures on the right hand side, that ability to create a program that can paint using style transfer has really evolved quite significantly. These are both from about 2020, I believe. The one on the left-hand side is Deep Dream using Van Gogh's style to paint a picture of the Eiffel Tower. So, Starry Night meets Eiffel Tower. The other one is a style transfer called Skeleton Necromancer. Now, it's in the style of Bakinski, I believe is his name. Now, he was a Polish painter, photographer, sculptor. He specialized in dystopian surrealism. This particular picture was generated by an AI program called The Big Sleep, which combines two neural networks and generates original paintings from text prompts. Programs like The Big Sleep indicate that AI art isn't simply a Snapchat filter. Other examples of original paintings generated by AI programs include this one here on the left, which is a portrait of a fictional character, Edmund Bellamy. It sold at Christie's for $432,000. It was created by a French art collective called Obvious using a program that was created by a different artist. Finally, this last painting here was created by an AI program to be sold in an art gallery of AI paintings. Again, it isn't a transfer piece. It is a piece created by this AI program for the purpose of selling it as an original piece of artwork. From my perspective then, AI's come quite a long way in terms of creating images like paintings in the last, say, six years. Progress has been much slower when it comes to generating prose and poetry. I think in part because when an AI paints a picture, it can do so in a way that's parasitic on the structure in the subject itself and the meaning that we already imbue to that subject. So in a way, a lot of the interpretive or insightful aspects of a creative work of art are already there for the AI. It doesn't have to add a lot of that stuff to the mix. When it comes to writing poetry like these two poems, then the AI has to actually take these individual nuggets and arrange them in a novel way that gives them an appropriate structure and an appropriate meaning. Now, I'll spare you a dramatic reading of either of these poems. I'll just note where they come from. The poem on the right was the winner of an AI poetry writing contest called Poetics. The poem on the left was a poem that was generated by an AI that was developed in Britain and that is on display or will be on display in Expo 2020 which actually doesn't occur till 2021. And they're not that bad, to be honest. They're not particularly coherent in their meaning, but they have the linguistic form and some of the lines in it actually seem not so bad to me. We can probably expect a lot of improvement in this area as it's a booming area of artificial intelligence right now. For instance, OpenAI has a program called GPT-3, which writes all sorts of texts like news stories about earthquakes, and which they say generates about 4.5 billion words a day. 
I'll end this lecture module by giving you a taste of a project by the Lost Tapes of the 27 Club. This group got an AI to create new songs from dead artists. And the piece that I'll play for you in part is a new song from the dead artist Kurt Cobain and Nirvana.